Hello guys. Uh, sorry in advance for the very bleak lighting today. I am recording this on uh, just my vlog camera because there is a lot going on this week. If you can't tell by my voice, I am actually pretty sick <laughs> and I've had um, client deadlines as usual. And then uh, we're also moving into our new house tomorrow. So uh, as soon as I finish recording this, I'm headed home early to try to get as much packing done as I can. I really haven't packed anything. So um, that's kind of what's going on. And that's why we're doing this low key with, uh, with the vlog camera. But um, um, anyway, this, if you missed last week's actual vlog with the vlog camera, um, I mentioned how we were kind of not like transitioning fully, but like, I guess, exploring a new direction for the channel where, um, I'm going to try to respond more to you guys and to what content you are looking for that you'll find helpful. Um, I'm still going to make vlogs. I'm still going to do, you know, my own self-initiated, uh, sit down videos for ideas that I think of. Um, but, uh, because I've been doing so many, uh, client projects that have non-disclosures where I can't show the work and I'm, uh, the reality is I've been doing more and more of those. They've been taking up more of my work time. Um, I had been thinking of, you know, ways that I could make, make content that would still be helpful for you guys and that would help me selfishly <laughs> do uh, the thing that I really love to do most, which is to, um, to help up and coming illustrators. So that is that. That's our intro here. And um, hopefully these will be recorded with my nicer camera and lighting and stuff in the future, but we are just doing it this way today. Uh, so this week's video, as you um, can probably already tell by the the title is about communicating with clients, specifically smaller clients or maybe private clients. So not the big commercial clients or editorial clients, but maybe people who would like buy a commission on Etsy or uh, really small businesses, or maybe somebody publishing a book, uh, self-publishing a book rather. Um, and I wanted to do a video about that because I've gotten a couple of questions this week. So it's, this video is inspired by Michelle and Megan, who both sent me questions that were kind of related to this topic. And I realized that I've talked about it in other videos, but not ever specifically about dealing with uh, smaller clients and kind of troubleshooting some of those communication issues. And it seemed like an important topic to tackle because I realize a lot of you, if you are getting started or if, if your route to getting started is similar to my route, you will do a lot more uh, private commissions and uh, commissions for small commercial clients uh, early on before you kind of move on to some of the bigger ones. So many of these uh, principles that we're going to talk about do translate in some way to the larger scale commercial clients. But um, for the purposes of this video, just imagine that we're talking about, you know, somebody who wants you to do a portrait of their dog or, you know, maybe paint their significant other, or maybe, you know, it's your mom's friend who makes some jam and she's going to start selling it and she wants you to do a little illustration for the packaging, uh, that sort of thing. So those kind of clients, or of course, somebody who is self-publishing a book. So that's who we are talking about here when we're talking about a client. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of different scenarios and talk about how to respond to them. And these are scenarios that would, um, come in, challenges or hiccups that can happen when you're working with that sort of a client. The first one is they ask you for a quote, but they don't send a lot of info. So they might just say something like, oh, I'm, I'm self-publishing a book, but, um, or I'm self-publishing a book and I'm wondering how much you would charge for illustration. I really like your illustration style. So that is really not very helpful at all in terms of how much info or how little info they included. So, um, what I would encourage anybody who gets that sort of an email, or even it might be a, you know, I want to have, I really like your style. I want to have you paint a portrait of my kids. How much would that cost? Even though you may feel, especially early on, you may feel pressured right away to get to quote them a figure to say a number. Um, I would try as hard as you can to restrain yourself and just respond with questions. So you might ask them, um, you know, if they're, I, I really don't know much about picture book illustration, but you know, what I would ask <laughs> if somebody sent me that email is, um, what, uh, I would ask them to send me some examples of the kind of stuff they like, the kind that they're the kind of illustration that they're looking for. Um, I would ask how many pages, whether they want a color, um, if they could point to some uh, examples on my website of the type of style that they like for 
from my work, uh, just trying to get a good sense for how much work would be involved. And then of course, questions like when would they need it by? Uh, and it is always good to ask if they have a budget in mind. The challenge with that, with smaller, um, smaller clients, private clients is most of them do not have a budget in mind, or maybe if they do, it's something, you know, criminally low, like they're going to pay you $25 for a, you know, a, a custom 11 by 14 portrait of their cat. Um, so just, I would just assume with, with this kind of client, I probably wouldn't even ask them what, what budget they had in mind. I would, I would stick more to what they're wanting and, um, and then, uh, and then go from there in terms of the pricing. So, um, another common challenge that could happen is, so they initially reach out to you and then you respond with questions and they don't reply to you. So, um, that could happen at, at several different phases in the process that maybe they just don't even respond to your question that you sent with, um, excuse me, to your email that you sent with the questions, the follow-up questions. Uh, and that could be for a few different reasons. It could be that, you know, they really weren't serious at all and they weren't, you know, planning on moving forward or they're not ready or they were just hoping to kind of have a figure, a ballpark figure in mind so that they could make some other decisions. So asking questions about what they're seriously wanting, they may genuinely not know. Um, and uh, in which case you have definitely <laughs> uh, dodged a bullet because uh, dealing with that sort of a client, like agreeing to work with that sort of a client, giving them a price upfront before you know what they really want is just going to be a huge headache. So um, yeah, that might be some reasons why they don't respond to your questions. Um, and uh, another reason would be uh, just to, to look at yourself and to look at your email and the, the questions that you sent them. So I would just quickly, if that was, if, if I was in that situation, I would quickly take a look back at the email that I sent, um, read through it, trying to imagine I'm this person and uh, get a sense for whether there's anything in there that could potentially be confusing, whether I used any sort of illustrator speak or um, artist lingo that they might not necessarily know. And I might send a single follow-up email. So they emailed once, I replied with the questions. Um, if I had radio silence from them, I might send a single follow-up a few days later just saying, was there anything you needed me to clarify or anything? anything that I could um, answer in terms of the, the information that I would need to move forward. Uh, and if they don't respond to that, then I, I would just not spend any more time worrying about it. And it's really hard when you're first getting started because it you may feel like it was something that you did, but the reality is you could have responded and told them a number and they would have been okay with the number and but still the project wouldn't have moved forward and then the one other scenario that's related to this could be if they didn't respond to your quote so you know say they emailed you you emailed the questions they responded with the questions you responded with the quote and then it's just silence from them um so the first and most obvious answer is <laughs> definitely could be true here and that is that um they didn't want to pay that much that it's more than they were hoping to pay. Uh, now at this point you may say like, Oh, I wish I had quoted lower. I wish I had said less, or, you know, maybe I should follow up and say, actually, I'd really be willing to do it at this rate. And that, that is a personal decision. And I can't tell you not to do that. But what I can tell you is that from my experience, whenever I have agreed to do a project, um, whenever I've negotiated against myself and like talked something down and agreed to do a project for less than I, um, want to or need to do it for, I've always regretted it. And it's always turned out to be extremely frustrating. And it, uh, I don't know why this is true, but in my experience, again, a lot of the clients who are, uh, who have crazy unrealistic low budgets are also very, very demanding. So just keep that in mind. You know, you may be thinking, oh, okay, well, I'll take this on and it, it will be pretty low key. It'll, it'll work itself out. Uh, and that just may not be true. So just because somebody has a low budget doesn't mean they also have low expectations. Often low budget and high expectations tend to go hand in hand. Uh, so again, here, I would send a single follow-up email, um, just asking if they had any questions, um, or if they, you know, wanted to know more, a common situation that could happen here is, you know, maybe you sent the price, but, uh, it wasn't totally clear what was included in that. I don't know what is happening outside, but there's some really big, loud, like banging sounds. Maybe it's a dumpster. 
Sorry about that. So what was I saying? Oh, maybe it wasn't totally clear to them what is included in the pricing structure. So you might um, want to really ex make sure that you're explicit about like how many revisions they would get, the size of the finished piece, any of those questions that they might be wondering um, or even questions about the process that could have come up. So it is worth a, a follow-up, one follow-up email. But if I had sent the quote and I followed up once and didn't hear from them, then I just wouldn't wouldn't go back there. I wouldn't send another one. Okay, so another uh, problem that could arise, another problem scenario is that you do a sketch and the client uh, doesn't respond to the sketch. So maybe you've gotten, this is essentially like a further step down the road. You've agreed on terms, you've started the project, um, and then you send the client the initial sketch or whatever you do for your kind of first round and they don't respond. They don't send feedback. They don't send their approval. It's just kind of silent. So for this kind of client, if it's a small client, you know, again, somebody who is a private individual, maybe looking for a commission that they're just going to hang up in their home or a really small upstart business or self publisher, um, many of those clients may not be, well, most of those clients will not be experienced in articulating their feedback. So if you're, again, on the other side, if you're working with big clients or um, not, not even necessarily big clients, but um, bigger clients and clients who regularly commission illustrators, they know how to communicate with an illustrator. They know how to say, they know the language for, you know, this can we change this aspect of the piece or can we tweak this aspect of the piece, um, that aspect of the piece. If it's a, a private individual or a small um, small commercial client, they uh, may you may be the very first illustrator that they have ever worked with. So um, I would send, um, definitely send a follow-up email like the next day. Like, so if you send, if you send something, if you send your sketch and you know, you've agreed in your project terms, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, what your timeline is and when you expect to receive revision if they haven't responded by then, definitely that day follow up with them and just say, hey, you know, wanted to make sure, uh, wanted to check in, see if there was anything that was unclear here, see if you had any questions, um, see if you wanted to talk through something. And again, this this may be tricky depending on your personality. I mean, I, I can say I really don't like talking on the phone, um, but uh, there are times, and this is one of them, when talking on the phone it may really be what's needed. So if you've sent the sketch and they haven't responded uh when you follow up with them i would also offer to say hey you know maybe it, it would make sense to just hop on the phone so we can talk things through real quick uh and nine times out of ten whenever i've done that even if i'm like dreading the phone call it's always a really good thing because it's easier to for somebody who isn't experienced in articulating their feedback to kind of talk it through with someone who knows what they're doing and knows what's going on so um yeah definitely try to see if you can set up a phone call and then um whenever i do that in that sort of a scenario, if there's no written feedback, then I will just take notes and email them to the client and just say, hey, this is what I heard you say, just to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, just that way there's a record of, of the feedback, there's a record of your communication. Another common problem, this is a, a problem with clients of every shape and size, <laughs> but is that they uh, ask for additional or beyond the scope revisions. Uh, so a, a big reason why this kind of a client um, may do that is again, because they don't really know. So they may, uh, may, maybe it's like the end of the project or no, let's say, let's say it's the sketch phase and they asked initially for a portrait of their daughter or whatever. And you, you know, the photo that they sent you was head and shoulders, but they want you to somehow like bring your hands up by her face. They may not realize that that is one, making the project more complicated, which should make it cost more. Uh, and two, that you're not going to be able to just imagine what her hands look like without some sort of a reference. So you're going to need a different reference photo. So they may ask for things that they just don't, they don't even really realize really what they're asking. So um, this is another reason why it's super important to have really clear uh, some sort of letter of agreement, if not like a, you know, a really um, long, robust contract, but at least some, some kind of written agreement where you go through what is included in a revision, what possible revisions are. Uh, this is another time that it might be helpful to hop on the phone and try to talk with a client and understand exactly what they're saying. So um, if you are in this situation already right now and you're stuck there, I would say try to talk on the phone and, and get clear about what's going to be possible. Um, and it's kind of a personal decision that you're going to have to make how much you want to flex like if they are asking for something that's out of the scope and you're 
you're stuck there right now, uh, yeah, you have to decide for yourself whether you're comfortable bending or whether you're going to say, no, this is outside of our scope. Um, and if you're not there yet, um, I would just incur, or if you're getting ready to, to start on one of these projects, encourage you to, to have that really clearly spelled out in your um, agreement, which we will talk about in a minute. Um, another uh, challenge is that they um, may not manage the project very well. So if you're working with an art director, um, much of the time they're going to bring a lot of structure to the project. They may have their own timeline already. They may even have their own contract. They're probably going to go and get you the uh, revisions, the references, the photo references. Um, they, they're they going to bring a lot of that. Um, yeah, they're going to bring a lot of the structure to the project. So a lot of the time you just kind of step in and play your role. And that's not to say that you shouldn't pay attention and um, maybe even have your own contract that has some of those things spelled out. Um, you definitely should. But um, the inverse of that, the version of that with a smaller client or an individual is that they very rarely will bring any of the structure. So if it's just somebody coming and asking for a portrait or for their, you know, mom and pop jam label, they, they just, they don't know. Again, this is another situation of them not knowing, and they're not trying to be difficult to work with, but they are relying on you as the expert. So you are going to have to bring all of your own structure. So you're going to have to be the one who, then that's not to say that you can't have input from them. So, you know, you might ask, you should ask if it's a private commission, you know, maybe they want it for a birthday present or for a wedding gift or something. So you definitely want to be clear on like, is there a time frame that they need it in? But you are going to have to be the one to say how long that's going to take. So if they say, oh yeah, you know, maybe like next Tuesday and that's four days away and you need a, a week to work on something, you're going to have to be the one to tell them like, I can get it to you by this day or that day. Um, because they just, they are not going to know what, what is required, what your process entails, how long something should take. So yeah, you will have to bring the structure. So another challenge that can happen is that they don't pay you on time or they don't pay you at all. If I'm working with a larger client, uh, somebody again, who regularly commissions illustrators, this isn't something that I worry about quite as much. Um, well, late payment is always a concern, but uh, ultimately that kind of client, I've never had them, you know, not pay me or not want to pay me. It sometimes just takes a lot longer because of their bookkeeping departments. For a smaller clients, I find that asking for payment up front, it just ensures that number one, that they're serious and that they are going to pay you. And, um, I think it makes them more invested in the process too. So they're more likely to get back to you with the feedback. They're more likely to respond to your emails because they have already put money on the line. So, um, if you're in the situation where you didn't do that and, and you're stuck, uh, I guess we'll have to make another video about that. Uh, cause we could talk for a while about that. But, uh, if you haven't done it yet, if you're about to work with this kind of a client, I would strongly advise you to ask for payment up front. Um, the one exception to that might be if it's like a really large project that's happening in phases because a small client might have a larger project as well, uh, especially if it's a self-published book. So in that case, you might ask for a, a sizable deposit, like a 50% deposit, and then have some kind of a, um, like a structure where you turn over some of the illustrations and they pay you and then you do more of the illustrations and they pay you again. Uh, but for, for most private or small commissions that are a, a couple of illustrations, less than a few illustrations, I would recommend payment up front. Okay. So we're going to wrap up, um, by just quickly going over the bare minimum, uh, of what to include in an agreement with a, a small client. So I've done a whole video about this. It's more for commercial clients um, and it includes more information. Um, I will try to link that on the screen and in the description, but I haven't ever talked this through with respect to smaller or private clients. So there are about seven things that I would strongly recommend you include in your agreement. Um, the first one is very simple. It's a, a section that I would just call, what will you get? Oh, and then this is just a note I would say about all of this stuff overall is try to put it in as simple, direct, um, plain language that's maybe not really um, artist specific. So like if uh, this first point that I'm going to talk about, the, the detailed description of what the person is going to get. If I'm working with a commercial client, I would call that a deliverable because that's what it is. <laughs> um, but if I'm working with a private client uh, and I say like deliverable, they, they may not know what that is. So try to stay away from the artist's language and just use um, really specific clear, obvious language. So, um, I might title that section, something like what you get or, um, yeah, what you'll, what you are buying, something like that. 
Uh, and then that should include the detailed description of what they're getting. So if they're getting a, um, if you're doing a, a custom illustration, but they're going to have it, you know, let's say our jam jar scenario again, I feel like I always use that example. I know I've used it in other videos too, but um, say you're in that scenario, the deliverable there would probably be a digital file. So you'll really want to clearly spell out, they'll be getting the digital file, you know, say how much, how, um, what the resolution is going to be, uh, whether it's high res or it should be high res if they're going to be printing it, um, and uh, tell them the size. And that would be true either way, whether they're getting a um, a portrait or uh, a digital file. So let them know if it's a digital file, like what the dimensions are going to be, either in inches or pixels. And then um, if it's a physical file, a physical file a physical um, object. If they're buying an original, like a physical illustration, let them know how big that's going to be. Um, spell out whether it's in color or black and white. If you're doing a portrait, be really clear. Portrait's going to include head, neck, and shoulders, or head, neck, shoulders, and hands, or a full figure. Um, don't just say, you know, portrait of so-and-so. Be really clear and explicit about what exactly is going to be included. If you're doing your jam jar and they, it's, you know, mixed berry jam, say it's going to have like one strawberry, one raspberry, and one blueberry, or, you know, a cluster of each or whatever, but you get the idea. Clearly, explicitly describe what they're going to be getting, both the, the actual thing itself, whether it's physical or digital, the dimensions and qualities of that thing, and, um, and then of course, like what is included in the illustration itself. So that's kind of like the most important thing. And then related to that, uh, next point is you obviously want to have a really clear price. So, um, it's challenging again when you're first getting started you may want to give a ballpark figure you may want to say like oh it's going to be between you know 200 and 300 but uh, i would encourage you if you can to try to say a clear um, one clear price so the client knows what they're getting and they know what they're paying if you're nervous about it so say again you're saying 200 to 300 for your range I would just say 300 so quote on the higher end and uh, that way you are kind of covered if you feel like um, you, oh gosh I'm not sure how long this is going to take or I wonder if I'm getting it over my head it's better just to ask for the the slightly higher figure um, or the dramatically higher figure whatever it is uh, next thing you want to include is a breakdown of the project timeline. So essentially what happens when. So this should be a list with the dates of kind of each phase of the project. So the project start might include, you know, you're, you're signing your letter of agreement, you're getting the, um, you're getting the reference materials from them. You're getting the either deposit or payment from them. That's all kind of stuff that has to happen before the project start. And then have like the date of the project start, the date that you'll deliver sketches and describe what they're going to get for sketches. You know, whether it's going to be black and white or pencil or tell them what they can expect. So you have listed them already in the project schedule, but this is where you're going to really clearly unpack them and what's included in each revision. So you um, want to clearly say at some point that, you know, the number, just the, the clear number of revisions that you're going to do. So if you say, I do it at this phase and at this phase, um, but you don't say the number, then, you know, people may say, okay, I'm going to get to revise three times at the sketch phase. And then I'm going to get to revise again at the, at the final phase. No, you want to make it clear that they get, um, you know, whether it's two or three, the, the, the flat number of revisions that they're going to get. Um, and then you want to spell out again when those revisions will happen. So you will have already said that somewhat in the project calendar, but uh, here is just another way to say it. And something that's as important as revisions can be uh, is, is helpful to say twice. All right, just a few more things here. There should be a list of what you need from the client. So um, there should somewhere in your agreement, there should be spelled out that you need um, payment and the, the contract and you know whatever reference materials, if there's other stuff that you need from them. Some of this may seem obvious or it may seem like, well, I, I don't want to say that because I don't want them to think that I think that they're dumb. And don't worry about that. <laughs> Just spell it out really clearly. Even if you think that something's obvious, they may not think it's obvious. And if they already know it, they're not going to, they're not going to mind you asking. So, um, the, the way that I like to phrase this usually is like a list of what I need from the client to get started. So I'll, I'll have this at kind of upfront, and make it clear that before I can get started on the project, I need you know them to sign the letter of agreement, to send their deposit, and to send me any reference images. And uh, if we've agreed on a date, then I'll say I need them by this date so that I can get started. And that way, say you need them by 
I don't know, April 24th or whatever, and they don't send them to you by that date, then you can bump out the timeline. So um, again, that may seem obvious, but a client, especially one of these smaller clients may not go there uh, in their own thought process. So um, next thing is clear instructions on how to pay you. Uh, this is another thing that may seem obvious, but um, make it clear how you accept payment. So if you accept PayPal, put your PayPal, uh, say that you accept PayPal and put your PayPal email in there. If you use some other sort of um, merchant software, software or you know if you want people to buy an Etsy listing or whatever put the directions really clearly really explicitly in the agreement and I haven't said this yet but the agreement you know with a small client like this I'm I might just put it in an email and um, and ask them in the like in the body of an email and ask them to respond with their approval if they you know accept the terms of the agreement and then the last thing would be rights so this is kind of covered partially in the what are they getting section, but um, you want to make it really clear who who owns the finished, like who owns the, the copyright to the illustration. So uh, another example, some years ago now when I was very first getting started, one of my earliest private commissions was a portrait and um, the person was really happy with the portrait and so much so that they went and had prints and mugs and other stuff made to give to gifts of their, um, to give as gifts to their friends and family. And um, it was cool that they liked it, but it was not cool that they went and made those things. But we had no no agreement and they didn't know, they didn't feel like they were doing anything wrong. But if it's really clear that, you know, there's, you're not transferring any reproduction rights, all they're getting, so in the, in the portrait example, all they're getting is the, the actual finished portrait. So any other rights, like the rights to, um, to reproduce it or to use it for commercial purposes, any of those remain with the artist. Um, and, uh, these sorts of things you can also Google. I would Google something like artists, copyright contract or artist contract, copyright language, uh, something like that. And then of course I always mention this, but my favorite, um, the graphic artist guild handbook for pricing and ethical guidelines, they do have some versions in there that are more tailored, some, some contracts, some agreements that are more tailored to, um, private commissions or to working with a smaller individual. Okay. I think that's it. This video turned out to be way longer than I expected, but hopefully you guys find some of this helpful. And uh, if you want to submit an idea for a video or questions, you can always leave them in the comments to this video, um, or you can go to kendallhilligus.com uh, backslash questions and submit it there, or you can email me. Um, any of those are fine. And uh, yeah, please do let me know too if you like the video, if you found it helpful. Um, and on to the thank yous. Thank you to Meg for editing this video. Thank you to my patrons for sponsoring it. And thank you to all of you for watching. And um, yes, I think, I feel like I'm forgetting something today, but um, must just be all of the general craziness. All right, that's it. Hope everybody has a great week and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.